So today starts module two of the self term circuits course. Uh, we will be covering templated synthesis. So this is kind of a sequence of strategies for hand compiling self time circuits and kind of building them from production rules up. Um, this builds on all of the fundamentals that we learned in the last module, and in particular, uh, of particular importance is encoding data. And so this first module will start with uh, dealing with multiple input requests from multiple channels or uh, emitting multiple output requests on multiple channels. Uh, so you can think of this as you have a pipeline stage and you either want to merge the inputs from uh, two channels and, and do some kind of computation with them, or you want to copy the output to multiple output channels at the same time. So let's start with the first case. Uh, we have two input channels, A and B, and we want to wait for a request on both A and B in parallel before forwarding that out on the uh, right-hand channel R. So we can start with our uh, standard weak condition half buffer reshuffling. We have our normal buffer, right? We have we wait for R dot E and L dot R. We raise the output request, uh, and then we lower the input enable, and then we hit the reset phase, right? So we wait for the output enable and input request to lower before lowering the output request, and then raising the input enable. And so we're going to modify this uh, to rather than dealing with just L dot R, we're going to have both A and B. So we're going to take all of the references to L, and in effect, we're going to replicate them. So uh, first, we'll just pretend we'll just assign L to be A, and then we need to add in uh, both requests and enables for B. And so uh, in order to wait for both the request for A and the request for B, we can just add them straight into the C element. So we, we wait for R.E. Now we wait for both A.R and B.R before driving the output request high. Then once we've driven the output request high, we can drive both input requests low. So uh, now we have two inverters, one for A.E and one for B.E. Uh, both waiting on the, on the output request. And then the reset phase is symmetric. So we wait for the output enable to lower, and we also wait for both input requests to lower before lowering the output request. And then similarly, we, we, we wait for uh, the output request to lower before raising both the enables. Now, this is the base case, but if this is all you're doing, then we don't actually need two copies of that inverter there for the enable. Um, rather, we can just make a wire fork on A.E and B.E and use a single inverter to drive that wire fork. And so now we have uh, a node. We've added a node, LE, which is just an internal node to this particular stage. And we have what are called aliases down at the bottom. So we assign, we, we connect the input enable for A and the input enable for B up to our wire fork on LE. Any questions so far? Okay. So the other, so the next thing to deal with is multiple, multiple output requests. And so we receive a token on the input channel L, then in parallel, we send a token out on both A and B. So again, we start with our weak condition half buffer reshuffling. Uh, and this time we're going to, going to modify any reference to our output channel R. And so those are highlighted in red. And so the first thing we're going to do, like before, we're going to assign our output channel to be named A. And then we're going to replicate any instance of that. And so where we had A.E and L.R driving R.R high, we now also have 
b.e and l.r driving b.r so two separate c elements one for uh the uh output on a and one for the output on b this allows them to happen kind of in parallel they're not they're not each waiting for both input enables they're they're each waiting for their own then once both output requests are high we can lower the enable and so this in this case the enable becomes a c element uh, which means that this we're, we're going to actually going to need to add space for the output inverter and the keeper and so this actually adds a whole bunch of gates into our cycle making it quite a bit slower and then the reset phase is symmetric we wait for you know we have two c elements again not a dot e and not l dot r drives a dot r down not b dot e and not l dot r drive b dot r down and the reset phase of l dot e which waits for both output requests to be low now again this is the base case and if this is all you're doing then you can take these two c elements and merge them just like we took the two inverters for the enable and merged them. And so what this looks like is now, instead of allowing the two output requests to be driven kind of in parallel, independent of each other, uh, they become synchronized in a single C element. And so we wait for both input and or both output enables to be high before we drive the output request. And we've created this kind of internal node with a wire fork uh, on, called RR which we use to drive L.E. So L.E. no longer has a C element, and this is actually, uh, has a much faster cycle time. Um, and then we create aliases for the output requests back to that uh, internal node of R. And so the, there's a trade-off between these two approaches, between this one using a C, single C element and this one using two. And this one will forward an input request on a ready channel before the other channel is ready. And so the forward latency of this one on the channel that comes first is much lower, but the cycle time of this whole process is longer because of uh, the C element on LE. This means that its operating frequency is lower, its latency is lower. Uh, also, because there are more C elements, we have, instead of just one C element, we have three here. The, the energy involved here is much higher. In this case, there's a single C element and a single inverter. And so the energy is much lower. The operating frequency is much higher except that the forward latency on a channel that becomes ready long before the other one will be much, much longer, right? Um, basically, the, the, the channel that is ready will have to wait for the other channel before receiving any kind of token on the end zone. And so there, there are distinct cases when you want to use one over the other. Um, so we have Three examples here, three exercises. Let's take a look at exercise one. So in exercise one, we have two input channels, A and B, and we want to wait for tokens on both A and B before forwarding a token on R. So our goal is to implement a full WCHB merge from A and B to R and make sure to properly reset all of the C elements involved. So this is using our normal E1 of one channel definite definition from channel.act. We look at channel.act. We have our E1 of one. Um, and then it's also got a source and a sync as previously seen in other exercises, except now that now we instantiate two sources, one for A and one for B. So the first thing that we need is uh, to specify our production rule body. So we start with PRS, g.bdd, g.gmd. And we're going to need an, an internal node for LE, 
which we want to assign to a.e and b.e. Then we can just use the single C element approach to this, which is uh, we wait for the output request on uh, R, and then we wait for both input, sorry, we wait for the output enable on R, then we wait for both input requests on A and B. So A dot R, or A dot D0, and B dot D0 before raising the output request. Now, we also need an, an internal node for the uh, that C element. So we have underscore RR, which we lower. Then we use that to drive an inverter on the output request. So that's the first C element. Then we need to drive the input enable. So we can use r.d0 to drive our internal node, le, low. Then we want to handle the reset phase, which is symmetric. So we wait for not for the, for the output enable to go low. We wait for the input requests to go low before driving our internal node high and then using that internal node to drive our output request low. Finally, we reset our input enable by driving LE high. Now we, we can reset this like we would reset any WCHB. We want to reset our output requests low, which means we want to prevent this production rule from firing during reset. So we guard against it using g dot underscore s reset in series. So underscore s reset is low when reset is high. And this is an NMOS transistor. So this is disabled during reset. And then on this side, we need to force the these production rules to fire. And so we use the uh, combinational version, not g dot underscore s reset or so because this signal is low during reset, it enables this PMOS causing this production rule to fire. And so we have our merge. So make E1 and we have our E1.PRS, uh, which is just the flattened act file that we had. We go uh, and open up PRSIM, uh, E1.PRS, source E1.RC, and then we can cycle and we'll see that uh, we wait for both input requests to go high before sending our output requests and then wait for both input requests to go low before lowering our output request as expected. And so we can run the analog simulation. We go into E1, Pearson env.prs, source Pearson.rc. It opens up the netlist, runs the simulation, and we can take a look at the results. You uh, test that spot up here. So we have our input requests, which would be a.d0, b.d0. So I put them on the same line there. We have our input enable, there's only one, and that would be, that's been aliased to A underscore AE. We have our internal node on our output request, underscore RR. We have our output request, R underscore AD zero. And we have our output enable, RE. And so notice that our transistor stack on the upper request there is getting a little long. And so the internal node here is taking a little, little bit longer to transition than we'd like. And so this is, I think this is where we should bring sizing in. So let's go back to our specification. 
and take a look at what's going on. So we look at e1.act. We have this production rule for underscore RR, that's three transistors long, three PMOS transistors long, and PMOS transistors are fairly weak. And we have this production rule for underscore RR here, that's four NMOS transistors long, and that's getting a little long for minimally sized transistors. And so we want to do something about this. Uh, we have in our globals.act, we have the definition for the uh, PN ratio, which is currently two. And then we have uh, you know, our normal kind of size is about six. Our minimum NMOS size is, is six lambdas. Our minimum PMOS size is six lambdas. And so we're gonna use those to define our size in here. If we look at E1.act, we can specify a transistor width at the base of a sequence of transistors. And we do so by saying some number of multiples of the minimum size. So we say NM, that would be the minimum. And then we have four transistors here in series. So we wanna scale it up by four, just as a simple kind of sizing heuristic. And so this size directive is replicated by ACT across all the transistors in this stack. So if we wanted to size the one down here, we could say four times the PN ratio or three times the PN ratio times the minimum size of a PMOS. And we get a much larger stack here, right? Much, more, much larger width here. The reset in this OR here can be set to the minimum PM size, right? The, the minimum PMOS size. And our inverters for the output requests here and here should be set to minimum size. This should be PM and this should be NM. And our inverters here for the input enable can be set to minimum. Any questions so far? So when you are doing the P minimum on our other inverters, will it automatically take into account the PN uh, ratio, or do you have to put that no. in explicitly? You caught me. I, I have to put that in explicitly. Okay. I mean, it might work, but... Yeah. Okay. Good catch. And then for the G reset as well, right? With the PN? Uh, reset can be just minimally sized, uh, regardless of PN ratio. Because we don't, we don't really need it to happen particularly quickly. Um, you know, we, we can give reset any amount of time. Like we, when you turn on a chip for reset, you can let it take 200 milliseconds or more. Yeah. I just didn't know if it was important for like consistency or something like Not between really. all your stuff or, okay. No, sometimes. Point, um, why are we not doing it for the NMOS reset as well? Uh, the NMOS reset is in series with the rest of this stack. Okay. Right, so the NMOS reset kind of, you know, when you have a stack of transistors and one is a lot thinner than the others, then that would be the kind of the bottleneck in its performance. Yep, okay. By default, when it comes to sizing, annotations. Act basically sizes every transistor minimum size. Uh, there is a line in the configuration file for the technology, which 
which specifies the um, minimum sizing for that tack. So if we look at Skywater, um, Skywater. If we look at Skywater 130 slash global at comp, there is a line in the global comp which specifies the default transistor you know, standard P and, and M width and length. And so when a transistor sizing annotation isn't there, it uses these numbers. And it's some number of lambdas. And so a lambda here is defined in micrometers, I guess. No, meters. 0.3 e to the negative six. So it's it's 30 nanometers here. Recompile. Made E1. And go into the analog simulation and see what see what that changed. So close down this old and then we, we go pure view test dot spy back here. So we've got our two input requests a and b we've got our input enable ae we've got our internal node underscore rr which looks a lot cleaner we've got our output request rr and we've got our input or sorry our output enable re and so now these signal transitions are taking a lot less time they're a lot cleaner overall Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So let's move on to our second example. So if we take a look at e2.act, we are making a copy. So we are taking the token from L and replicating on both A and B. So it's the same basic structure as the previous example. These are data list channels. We have our source and our sync. This time we instantiate two syncs, one for A and one for B, rather than two sources. Let's start working through this. So for our copy, the first thing that we need is to write out the production of bodies, so g.ddd, g.gnd. The next thing that we'll need is to build out our internal nodes for the C elements on A and B. So bool underscore AR underscore BR. And I'm gonna do the separate C elements approach to this. So you see kind of the effect of uh, the two approaches. So first we're gonna start with the C element on A. We're going to wait for the, the enable on A to be high. And we're going to wait for the input request before driving the internal node for that C element low. Then we're going to have the C element for B. We're going to start with the enable on B. We're going to wait for the input request before driving that output internal node low. Then we need the inverters on those uh, C elements. So we wait for that internal node to go low before driving the output request high on each one. We replicate across the two. 
Now we get to our C element on the input enable. And so we're going to need a couple of internal nodes here. Uh, let's call it uh, L LE internal and underscore LE, something like that. And we're going to have A dot D zero and B dot D zero. So it's going to drive LE internal down. That's an internal node, so we want to use that to drive underscore LE up, which we then use to drive the actual enable low. Now, the reason that we do this is because if we didn't insert these extra two inverters here, we wouldn't have space for a state holding gate on the C element. Because that feedback needs an inverted value. And that inverted value needs to come from somewhere in the cycle. And so otherwise that state holding gate would be kind of plastered off to the side and you can actually get instability as a result of that. Is there a reason why the internal node of your C element can't be an output? It's just because of like transistor sizing essentially, or is there more of a reason? Uh, acknowledgement, right? Every transition needs to be acknowledged, even the transitions on the feedback inverter. Okay. Right. So because because if I if I made it like this you'd still have this inverter. What, would, what you'd get is basically this. In order to be able to have the feedback in your C element. And that extra inverter would just be kind of flapping around in the wind. Right, it's not part of any cycle. And so you'll, you'll generate a whole bunch of instabilities in your weak feedback. That makes sense. Yep. Gotcha. All right. So let's do the other side of this. Not a dot e and not l dot e zero. So we're waiting for the output enable to go low and the uh, input request to go low before driving our internal nodes. We're going to replicate this on b. And then we're going to use that to drive our output requests low. So underscore AR drives A dot D zero low, underscore BR drives B dot D zero low. Now we need to handle the reset phase of our weird C element on the enable. So we get not A dot D zero and not B dot D zero because it's symmetric. Then LEI up. When LEI goes up, then we drive underscore LE down, which drives L dot E up. So it's, it's entirely inverted from the set phase. Now we want to reset this. And we have some benefits here. So we need to reset both our output requests low. And Unfortunately, unlike the PCHB example, this doesn't make its way into the uh, production rules for the output requests. So we have to use kind of the standard WCHB reset rules, which is uh, the block on uh, the, the forward drivers in the set phase. So G dot underscore S reset and G dot underscore S reset and and then the forcing rule on the on the reset phase. So not g dot underscore s reset four. Now, because both of our output requests will be reset low, we know that this rule is disabled, and we know that this rule here is enabled on reset already because both of these signals will be low already. 
And so we don't need to come up with a reset for the C element on the input enable. So that is our circuit. Let's see it in action. Okay. And so we're running the netlist. We can cycle it for a little while, a little while longer. And let's take a look at the output. So we have our input request on L, our input enable on L, our output request on A and its internal node, our output request on B and its internal node. And they kind of look identical because the input enables on A and B are, you know, basically happen as fast as they can. So there's no, there's nothing blocking the input enable from going high or low. And then we have all of our internal nodes on LE. So let's bring them in. So here's LE, here's the internal node, and then the second internal node here. All right, let's zoom in to take a look what's going on. So there's the, this effect on the transitions in LE. You'll see that the first internal node takes a little while to transition. The second one is almost instantaneous, followed by the third one, which is also which is also pretty much instantaneous. And so that internal node in the C element itself always takes a little longer because it has to fight that weak feedback. It doesn't really have to be soon, but at some point, could you put together a simplified pipeline with multiple stages so that we can kind of see how all this is meant to work together? Because I feel like that would help me kind of I'm yeah, used to top sure. down design. So uh yeah, so let's go back to lecture I believe it was three with the WCHB. Uh E one one LR WCHB dot okay. So let me just real quickly write this. Um it was R. Double check my channel. Yep, R and E. So I've just created a WCHB buffer. Mm -hmm. And we're going to create a process for a FIFO. Right, so it has the same kind of interface, left and right. And we're gonna to wanna to instantiate an array of WCHB buffers. So WCHB, okay. um, and we'll just call this buffers. We're gonna make, let's say, four of them. And we're gonna have uh, an array of kind of internal channels. So with four buffers, we're gonna have five channels minus the two for the outputs. So we're gonna need three internal channels. So E1 of one, we'll call those uh, M, I guess. So I'm not going to use any templating here because that will kind of complicate how we interpret and understand this. So we're just going to have buffer zero with our globals. On the left, we're going to have L. On the right, we're going to have M zero. I'm replicating this for our four buffers, buffer one, 
for two, buffer three. On our left for buffer one, we're gonna have M0, and it's gonna forward to M1, and from M1 to M2, and from M2 to R. Does that make sense so far? Yep. Okay. So then we're gonna take our, rather than instantiating a WCHB, we're gonna instantiate our FIFO, as we've designed here. And let's run it. Uh, E1. Buffers. All right. And let's just take a look at the analog simulation since that is easier to look at. PRSM ENV.PRS source PRSM.RC. Let's let it go for a little while. PR view test.spy.prm. Um, what is going on? CHB. Ah. In the make file, when I call make E1, it instantiates a particular process. And so I want that to be FIFO. Fun side effect of the tools we are using. Make E1. So now when we have our dot, we have FIFO down at the bottom. Let's run the analog simulation. And it's going to take a little longer here. Mm -hmm. Let's get it going for a little while. All right. PR view, test that spy up here. There we go. Now we have all of our signals. So let's take a look at L. So the request on L, the enable on L, let's put it in the same one. The request on M0, the enable on M0, the request on M1, the enable on M1, the request on M2, enable on M2, the request on R, and the enable on R. Okay. So we can see that the request Looks like there's some reset behavior that's happening here, mm -hmm. which is a little odd. But the request on the input request on L goes high, the input enable goes low, but not before being forwarded on M0. And so it just the request just slide down the the FIFO. Okay. And if we make a longer FIFO, you'll see that you can have multiple tokens going at once. Right now, the FIFO is, the, the forward latency of the FIFO is far faster than the operating frequency. And the operating frequency is ultimately determined here by the digital simulation. But I wonder if we can make that not a problem. So let's take a look at uh, at PRSM.RC. 
So it's saying, so our current randomization is between zero and 10. Let's reduce that to zero and one, just to make it as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And let's see that again. LR, LE, M0R, M0E, M1R, M1E, M2R, M2E, and then RR. Now you can start to see overlap in the requests. <laughs> 